Welcome to the uh, Kinder Institute Forum. This is our premier lecture series on urban issues here in Houston. Uh, we bring in urban thought leaders from around the country and around the world to Houston. You, many of you have been here before. I really appreciate your being here for tonight's uh, presentation with Mitch Silver, and I will get to that in a minute. I do want to remind you that we should that, that we will be live tweeting, and you might want to live tweet as well using hashtag KI Forum. And you can follow us on Twitter at, at Rice Kinder Inst, I, I -N -S -T. This event is being live streamed. Uh, I think we handed out note cards. What we'll do is, those of you who've been here before know that what we typically do is um, you write your questions out on the note cards. This makes it a lot more efficient. We get more questions in. Uh, and then our staff will be collecting the note cards and giving them to me, and then I'll ask the questions and our speaker will answer. Um, uh, the, the, the KI Forum is made possible thanks to our friends at Centerpoint Energy, the lead sponsor of this series. So I'd like to, <coughs> I'd like to invite Gloria Bounds to come on up, give a few brief remarks from Centerpoint Energy. Thanks for being here tonight, Gloria. Hello. Good evening. My name is Gloria Luna Bounds, and on behalf of Centerpoint Energy, I'd like to welcome you to Kinder Institute's Public Forum with Mitch Silver. We're proud to partner with and support the Kinder Institute for Urban Research through valuable public forums such as this. We're a domestic energy company that includes electric transmission and distribution, natural gas distribution, and energy services operations. With more than 14,000 employees, Centerpoint Energy and our predecessor companies have been in business for over 140 years. We know that reliable energy is not a luxury. We have an unwavering commitment to safely and reliably keep the lights on and provide clean natural gas for your homes, factories, and businesses. Parks and public spaces and making them inclusive and equitable for all is a topic of great importance to Houston and Centerpoint Energy. It's crucial that our customers and our employees have access to healthy environments such as these spaces. And it's an exciting time to be here in the city of Houston to see so many ongoing projects within this space and on every scale. Some of our recent involvement with public spaces and commitment to environmental stewardship include working with the Houston Parks Board on its first hike and bike trail on a Centerpoint Energy right-of-way, starting at Sims Bayou Greenway and eventually connecting to the dedicated on-street bike lanes. We celebrated the trail's grand opening in 2019. And we're excited to partner with other governmental entities in the future to expand the use of trails in the Houston area. In addition, we're continuously looking for new ways to reduce the impact on the environment. Through our conservation programs, we promote energy efficiency to millions of customers. We have various programs such as recycling waste programs, protecting wildlife, working with alternative fuel vehicles, and increasing Houston's green canopy by distributing and planting responsibly trees, thousands of trees each year at schools, on bayous, esplanades, trails, and parks. We're proud to be partnering with all of you tonight. We're proud to be a working partner. We'll remain committed to working and serving responsibly for all of you, our customers, and our communities. Thank you. Um, in addition, generous support for this uh, lecture series also comes from a multi-year grant from our partners at Houston Endowment. In addition, the Institute itself also relies on philanthropic investments from many contributors. Our special thanks go to Richard Nancy Kinder and the Kinder Foundation, Laura and Tom Bacon, Chevron, Wells Fargo, Raynette and Stan Merrick, BP America, Catherine and Hank Coleman, Sis and Hasty Johnson, Francie Neely, Becky and Ralph O'Connor, Bank of America, Bracewell, HEB, Heinz, PNC Bank, Silver Eagle Distributors, <clears throat> and the United Way of Greater Houston. Um, I said at the beginning that we, uh, uh, our goal here is to bring in th urban thought leaders from around the country and around the world uh, to, to, to give provocative comments about what they're up to and their observations on, on Houston. And Mitchell Silver is certainly one of the leading uh, thought leaders on urban issues uh, in the country. Uh, Mitchell and I have been talking for a long time about having him come and to participate in the KI Forum. Uh, he's got this pesky day job uh, which has prevented him from coming up to now, but we're thrilled to have him. Mitchell Silver uh, is the Parks Commissioner for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, where he oversees nearly 30,000 acres of parkland. Um, he has a long and distinguished career as an urban planner. He went undergraduate to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, studied urban design, 
master's degree in urban planning from Hunter College in New York. <clears throat> um, he was formerly the deputy planning director of the District of Columbia and for many years was the planning director of Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, from 2011 to 2013, he was president of the American Planning Association, which, by the way, will be holding its annual conference here in Houston in about six weeks. Um, <clears throat> and in addition to that, for those of you uh, who are active in the field of urban planning. Mitch is not only a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners, FAICP, uh, he is also the current president of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Um, ah. <clears throat> Mitch, those are all the planners in Houston. Um, he is known for his innovative projects such as the Community Parks Equity Initiative, Parks Without Borders, Cool Pools, and Creative Courts, many of which we'll hear about tonight. Um, uh, he was elected to Plan Edison's list of 100 most influential urbanists uh, in 2017. He ranked higher on the list, by the way, than me, and was named as one of Urban Time's top international leaders of the built environment in 2012. <clears throat> and if that's not enough, you know Mitch is a smart guy because and I speak from personal experience how important this is, he married a Houstonian. <laughs> he married a proud Houstonian who went to the uh, uh, High School of Visual and Performing Arts, right? So, <clears throat> so it is my pleasure, finally, after several years of talking about this, right, to introduce to you Mitchell Silver. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, we met about 10 years ago, and Bill is a man I highly respect. And yes, uh, there's a limit on how often he let me travel, and so I'm glad after waiting a couple of years, I was finally able to return. Yes, my wife is a Houstonian. Uh, she was raised in the Fifth Ward, but now they call it Cashmere Gardens. Uh, she went to Mother of Mercy and then went to the HPVA. And so uh, I, my first visit here is to we were in Pratt, we broke up, she moved to Houston, I chased her. Uh, when I finally got here, she took me on a tour to Montreux, so I remember this area and actually being in this museum, so it's nice to come full circle. Uh, just want to thank uh, all the sponsors, I'm, uh, as well as the kinders, I met them before we started. Also, I want to give a shout out to a couple of friends that are here, Roberta Burrows, I know you're in the audience somewhere, Roberta, we spent the last weekend together. Uh, it was business, just so you all know. <laughs> And Jeffrey Lowe, uh, someone I work with very closely at APA and other good friend. So it was certainly a, a pleasure to be here. So I'm excited. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about New York and some of the issues that uh, Bill had mentioned. But equity is something that's near and dear to my heart. It's one of the reasons why I left uh, Raleigh, North Carolina to go back to my hometown of New York. Uh, just to let you know, it was mentioned, my background's in urban planning. And thank you for the applause. Uh, the only good thing about my job is my name is on a lot of construction park signs and it says FAICP all over New York City and so my staff learned what it means so I'm glad at least two people in the room know what it means. Uh, but I remember when I was appointed uh, a lot of people were just kind of cruel. It's like ex-planner becomes parse commissioner. And I was like, ouch, that hurts. I'm still a planner. And it wasn't until 2017 when I got my revenge we had an annual conference in New York and after a year in planning I was like, wow, people hug you. I mean, they really hug you when you open up a park. And I had to tell them at the conference that, you know something? People hug you when you complete a park. And my, all, all my years as a planner, no one ever gave me a hug for a comp plan or a zoning ordinance. So it's something I truly enjoy. So I'm going to go through this, but I do have to applaud you, Houston. Uh, I get to travel all over the country and the world, and there is a buzz about this city because of your investment in parks and public space. You're one of the cities people are talking about. Uh, really, the, the care and stewardship of Herman Park and Memorial Park and the Buffalo Bayou. And if you don't know this, that cities are being revitalized by focusing on their parks and public space because it makes cities livable. And that is what we're finding out. A lot of the real estate brokers, and even in New York, all the online uh, real estate uh, folks that are trying to find people apartments, the number one item on our list right now, the amenity they're looking for, is no longer schools is access to parks and public space. I know people like their backyards, but you can't run five miles in your backyard. You can't bike 10 miles in your backyard. You certainly can't have a 20,000 person concert. So our public spaces are revitalizing cities across the country. And now I'll get formally into my presentation. I look forward to your questions. So first, I want to give you an overview of our park system. 
Now, this is New York. Don't get jealous. There'll be a lot of oohs and ahs. But yes, it is a 30,000 acre park system, close to 2,000 parks. My staff ranges in size from 7,000, and in the summertime with our seasonals, we're as high as 11,000. Our operating budget is $580 million, and our capital budget, this is all public dollars, is $5 billion. So we complete about 100 capital projects a year. New Yorkers demand quality public space. As I said, it's their front yard, it's their backyard, it's where people connect. And they demand, as you see, all these assets is what I oversee, including 400 concessions all throughout our parks, which generates $65 million worth of investment every year. Now, that goes into the general fund, but still, we want to provide those experiences in parks so people can come out and enjoy it. And right now, I'm managing about 640 active projects throughout the city. I've completed about 700 since I've been there for six years, and I get great joy because I know what it does to help change our communities. But I want to set the context for where we're going to tell you first where we came from. If you go back to the 19th century, parks were really viewed as gardens. In fact, if you go to the Europe, they call it parks and gardens. These green spaces were places you stroll through. You didn't stop. You didn't picnic. You didn't sit on a bench. You just walked through the garden, and you observed it, and you strolled through. And this was a real influence by Olmsted and others to come here in the United States to develop our park system. And then when you move to really the mid-19th century, 20th century, this new profession called landscape architecture emerged. You're looking at Bethesda Terrace in Central Park. And for the first time, you had a profession that shaped land for the public to enjoy. But what was different about Umstead is he wanted to be accessible for all people, regardless of your income, your economic status. He wanted these public spaces that were welcome to all, democratic public spaces. But now you had his beautiful architecture and land being shaped for the public to enjoy. And this really transformed America because now cities were either hiring Umstead or others to build these incredible public spaces in their cities. Then we get to the 20th century, and a person by the name of Robert Moses, and yes, I sit in his office. I'm the anti-Robert Moses, correcting all his mistakes. I'll take the applause. Now, there are two Robert Moseses. There's pre-war and post-war. The pre-war was a pretty cool guy. In fact, it was that era that people were dying in the river from cooling off and trying to swim, and he built 658 playgrounds and these incredible uh, recreational facilities, and that's where parks and recreation started. That was back then in its recreational era from 1930s to 65, but the term parks and rec stuck. And so that was all responsible for Robert Moses and again across the country. It wasn't just about parks, but these recreational elements that people could enjoy. And then we move into the late 20th century and there was this whole environmental movement where many cities, older cities, had these industrial lands near the river, places where people never had to get a chance to interact with. And because we saw a transformation in our industrial and manufacturing industry, we had these contaminated, abandoned, and unloved lands, many of them close to the waterfront. And for the first time in New York, we said, you know something? We're going to transform this land and not give it to developers, but give it to the public. You're now looking at Riverside South, next to the Hudson River, People did not have access to this land, and city after city is taking these unloved spaces, healing them, and giving the best land to the public and developers. If you just go upland a bit, you get the views, but now you have this incredible amenity. This is a green way up the entire west side. Oh, there is my wife, my sister, and my daughter. I forgot they're in there. So there's a Houstonian. My wife is the one with her hands talking. So that's my beautiful wife, Mary Singletary, maiden name Lamarck. So if you know anyone from that... That's my wife. Oh, so good to see I miss you, honey. All right, good to see her there. <laughs> and who knew an abandoned railroad that was about to be torn down could be resurrected, transformed, and become one of the most Instagrammable parks on the planet? You're looking at the High Line. It is a three-dimensional experience. Every time you go back, it's a linear park, but you get a different view again and again. Taking unloved and neglected land and turning it back to the public, they now have close to 8 million visitors a year. And if you go there, you'll know how you have to shuffle down and see it, but still is a great place to go. And then I grew up in Brooklyn. This is now Brooklyn Bridge Park. Who knew? You could now kayak in the East River. 
When I was a kid, I did not have access to this location. Now to be there and look at the incredible views is about a 20 minute walk from my house. I am telling you that city after city are being transformed by leading with their parks and public space. So all of you that are investing in your parks, it is a great investment because you're doing something now for both the future, uh, present and future generations. So if you look at the 21st century parks, that's where we've been, where are we going? Number one, parks are not just uh, green spaces, they're public spaces for people. They're not just for physical health, but for mental health. Study after study will tell you, just being in a park for 20 minutes will improve your mental health. It'll reduce your anxiety, it will reduce stress, and it actually in some cases will reduce crime. So I tell people, don't take a mental health day, just take a walk in a park. And you're seeing study after study will show the impact being in green space has on the brain. And it's not just part of this, it's now part of the city's infrastructure. You'll see more cases like you have a bayou, it's serving as recreation, but also has a stormwater purpose. And for us, it's the first line of defense on climate change. I will talk a little about resiliency and what happened. You had Harvey, we had Sandy. There were some lessons learned. It was a wake up call for New York City about how are we thinking, how to use our parks. They don't just serve one purpose. Now they're serving multiple purposes as we see the climate changing in our city. So when I talk about what's next, uh, the mayor charged me with uh, what we need to do uh, to change our park system. He purposely wanted to hire a planner and not a person in parks because he wanted to know how will parks change in the 21st century. First and foremost, it was a big focus on equity. I'll talk about that tonight. The second about planning and placemaking. I'm a planner, so it was refreshing uh, for the parks employees to have a planner's perspective. Uh, so I'll talk about resiliency and sustainability. Uh, very sh briefly, uh, caring for parks, not just maintenance. This is something I'm teaching my staff and work with our volunteers. Maintenance is really doing a checklist. Caring is something very different. I have a 21-year-old daughter. When I raised her, I didn't maintain her. <laughs> I cared for her. Caring for a park comes from a different part of the soul. Maintenance is a checklist. So we want to go beyond just routine maintenance and show how we care, and that's where our volunteers come in, because they do that extra value added caring, and now our staff is doing the same. And then we did a lot of innovation technology. We were still stuck in the 20th century, and now we have a lot of analytics to make sure we are the best, the best as public sector employees that outperform any private sector client on caring for our parks and public spaces. So let us do equity first. So when I came on board, uh, there was a senator uh, that uh, felt the way we deal with equity was he was gonna create a bill that was gonna take money from the affluent conservancies and just give it to the underserved parks. And I was like, okay, Mayor, I don't think that's gonna work. So he said, great, you have six months to come up with a plan. And the plan we came up with was called a framework for an equitable future. Let me put that in context with you. New York City did a great job over the past uh, two decades of investing in parks. Close to $6 billion were invested in parks in New York City. We acquired uh, over close to 1,100 acres, and we came up with this walk score. I know you work with TPL, so you're probably familiar with this. And we want to make sure as many New Yorkers as possible was within a 10-minute walk to a park. New York City is 81.5%. We're trying to get to 85% by 2030. San Francisco is the only city with 100% walk score, and Washington, D.C. is closely gating on that 100%. But when I came commissioner, I said, you know, the walk score is great, but there's one problem. It shouldn't just be about proximity. It should be about quality, because I can walk to some of those parks with a 10-minute walk and I would not let my child or grandchild play or step foot in that public space. So I knew that it wasn't just about proximity, although that's important, it was also about quality. And so for us, equity became the key word we wanted to pursue. And when I use the word equity, I don't like these long definitions, it means fairness. Are we fair about how we invest in our capital dollars? Are we being fair about how we maintain our parks? Are we being fair about how we hire our employees and the answer to us was, no, we weren't. And we had to do something about it. So we decided to take an equity-driven approach to find out how equitable have we been. I told you we spent close to $6 billion over 20 years. How many of our parks, all the 2,000, received less than a quarter of a million dollars over 20 years? And in the parks business, that's virtually nothing. And it turned out 
we had 215 parks within our system that seen little to no investment. Seniors, children, families, while they saw other parks getting redeveloped, theirs remained unchanged. 20 years, from kindergarten to college, no change whatsoever. And the mayor and I said, that's not fair, and we have to change it. So the mayor, to his credit, uh, decided to put capital dollars where his the money is, where his mouth is, and he decided to invest over $300 million to transform 67 parks. This is not a light touch. It's scrape it down to the dirt and rebuild an entire new park or playground for the 21st century. We did some uh, minor improvements in the short term. It takes us about three years to design, procure, and build. And so we did things like painting sports courts, painting play equipment, uh, planting uh, a lot of shrubs and trees, just as a down payment until we can get the park done. And this was transformative. Again, these are spaces that have been neglected for 20 years, and I'll give you an example. So there it is. That's one of New York City parks. Doesn't look fun. You want to go and roll around on the asphalt. I don't think you do stuff like this, but this is a Robert Moses era playground. It got kids off the street, and I played. You know, there's the baseball diamond. There's first base. And I have all the bruises to prove it, but this is what the public space was. And this is not one I would call a space that I would want to enjoy, but it's in a walk score. It's within a 10 minute walk, so it counts. But to me, it didn't measure up. Uh, so my question is, is this a park or a parking lot? I remember the council member and I were just looking for one blade of grass, just one. We, we couldn't find it. I'm gonna come back to this one later because this one was uh, actually uh, converted. This one's a little bit better because it has trees and a bench. You know, you can sit there, have a picnic. Maybe you want to propose to someone, you can get on your knee and just... This one also was on the walk score. And so we knew that this was not fair as they passed other neighborhoods and saw these incredible green and transformed spaces. This was what they called their local park. Then, I don't know if you have this, but in New York City, we have this sign, no adults except in the country of a child can go into that space. Yes, if you're an adult, you don't have a child, you will get a summons. Now, my alternative is that either we change this policy or I'd have to put a concession out of each one of these parks so you can rent a child so you can go in. <laughs> this, too, was not fair. Because if you think of our walk score, if you were 12 and under, you had access to all the parks in New York City. But if you were over 12 and you were a senior, you could not go into that park with a comfort station and enjoy the nice greenery. And so we did change these signs citywide. They're gone. And that because I felt it was not fair. Once you understand equity, the implementation becomes easy. So what do we do? We decided to come up with a whole new design palette. We had a new precedent, adult fitness equipment. Uh, we have now these spray features that people can't get to a pool. We have so many places where children can go and to cool off, so that's now a good feature. In the wintertime, there are still nice play features that kids can play on. Summertime, they're activated where they can go there and cool off. Uh, we decided to use vibrant colors and get away from that dark asphalt because these are now community centers, town centers, they're open spaces, but to make them vibrant and attractive where now people are smiling, they feel happy. In fact, if I didn't tell, well, I'll wait to that one later. Uh, when we went out to the community, they wanted to see more green. These places, we broke them up. A lot of them now have stormwater capture underneath because now they're serving multiple purposes, taking that stormwater out of our system. And now there are places where people can enjoy less asphalt, more pervious surface, more green. And then because we have an aging population, we redesigned our parks to have lots of benches, lots of places to sit. Seems like to sit at the edge. We want to make sure they're for families. We now have certain tables where someone with a wheelchair can enjoy themselves. But now we have a lot more seating of all types so that people can go to these parks and enjoy themselves as a family. This is a departure because a lot of people don't want to have benches because it'll attract the homeless, it'll attract this one and loitering. Parks are for all, A-L-L. -L. And we want to make sure it was welcoming for all because uh, people of all ages want to go and enjoy their public spaces. So I'm going to show you uh, two examples of some of these parks I'm referring to. This one's in the South Bronx, right next to a community college. Uh, it's called Garrison Park. This one is under construction. So if you invite me back, Bill, I'll show you what the after, but I do have some renderings. 
But this is the entrance. Isn't it exciting? You can't wait to go inside and just explore this park. This one, like the other ones, is not pure asphalt. This one has a lot of vegetation, so there is some grass, and there it is. I, I, I want you to look at this for a second and imagine taking your child there to say, go play. I'd leave. To me, I could not believe that this was in our park system. I was personally embarrassed that that counted as a public space. And we knew that something had to change. And so we wanted to make sure it adopted all of our principles. Uh, because I'm a planner, we looked at the context. This is now near a college. We wanted to have a nice center green where the students can enjoy themselves. Spray features, multi-generational for seniors, for young people. Want to make sure we opened up those sight lines so it didn't seem so foreboding and hidden. And now when the design is finished, it's going to look like this. Same space. Same space. And now this is the community for 20 years will now have for the community and for the college now a gathering space where they can study, learn, connect. There's a spray feature, lots of seatings for seniors. And so right now this one's under construction, should be finished, I believe, sometime this year. Here's another one in the Bronx. Uh, this was overtaken by people who were kind of gambling and drinking little nip bottles of liquor and staff had to go in and clean it up. And even though this was a park, the community didn't use it because they were intimidated by the use. We closed it off for construction. We came in there with volunteers to reclaim the park. And it went from something like this that the community never used to this. The day we opened it, there were over 250 people waiting online to get in for the grand opening. And I'd never remember this woman in Spanish came up to me and says, muchos gracias, saying, you don't know what this means. We can't afford to, go, afford to go to places for a vacation. This is where we take our children to play each and every day. And this is like a water play paradise. There's basketball courts and sports courts on the other side. This place is always packed. I'll never remember that, that little, this, this little girl. This is a hot July day. Do you see how refreshed she is, that water hitting her face? <laughs> and the grandparents can sit there and watch their kids play. I mean, it was such a transformation. I remember the woman getting up who lived in a public housing project nearby crying because she said, you don't understand as long as we lived, that park was there, but it was never ours. And now they have this public space where they can grow and connect and thrive as young children. Then this is another one we're doing. Uh, it's called Anchor Parks. I told the mayor, don't give me money for acquisition. Give me money to fix the older parks. I know there's a low line, the this and that, all this. No. Give me money to fix the old parks. Our tagline is let make, let's make old parks new again. And here's one of them. This is in Highbridge. It's in northern Manhattan. I don't know what those red things are. Sometimes I don't want my staff to leave the country because I go to some foreign country and go, oh, I saw these red squiggly things. And there it is. I don't know what in the world that is. But the play units are so far apart, a parent can't watch their kids. They usually have a two to five and a five to 12 play equipment. They were so far apart, a parent would get exhausted running back and forth. But we decided to change the design. It's the only flat part of this park. The Harlem River is to the, it's a big drop. And so it's gonna go from this, this one too is under construction, to this. I remember we did this open, we did the ribbon cutting on a Saturday. And there were uh, a family, they were all boys, and they went up to the rendering, this one, and he kept turning to his mother saying, Mommy, is this is for us? This is for us? Knowing what is there. And so we want this to be a gathering place where memories will be created. And so this is the transformation. Again, this is another community where hadn't seen investment in that public space for 20 years. Do you remember that parking lot I told you about? It's one of them that got transformed. Uh, we came up with a nice design. And it now looks like this. We opened it up a few months ago. You can clap, because I love it. <laughs> There's a backstory behind this. Maybe q and I can get to it, but I want to make sure I move this along, because I have four of the top, two other topics to cover. So this one was, a, there's the same elevated, uh, but this is one where two different ethnic groups came together uh, to come up with this design, which to me was a, a great backstory. Now, I also love these love notes that people leave for us in parks. We were renovating this park. I told my staff, do not paint over this bench. This is a love note. You save those in your pocket. You don't paint it over. But here are two stories I'll share with you about why 
this is so powerful. The one I'm going to show you is one of the parks that hadn't seen investment in 20 years. It was near a nursing home. I always tell my staff as a planner, don't just design in the boundaries, find out what's surrounding it. There was a nursing home across the street. We looked at the nursing home. There were no outdoor public areas where loved ones can go and visit and spend time with their mother, father, or whomever it may be. So I said, let's design a garden in this park, a seating area. It's right across the street from the nursing home. The day we cut the ribbon, this woman in a wheelchair came up to me and saying, Were you, are you the one responsible for this? And I said, yes. She squeezed my hand and said, because of you, I'm going to live longer because I sit here with my daughter and watch my children play basketball. And there it is. Exceeded my expectation. There's even a cutout so a wheelchair can go under the table and that's where she sits to watch her kids play basketball. In fact, this is now the destination where everyone in that nursing home will go. And they thought it was theirs, it is, but this is something that totally just changed this whole nursing home and this community that again, this was just an asphalt field. The next one is difficult for me to talk about because every time it just really breaks my heart. Uh, another asphalt playground in Brooklyn, uh, the little boy, the day we're opening it up, would not come in. We put a new track, synthetic turf, new landscaping. So I asked one of my staff members, can you please ask this little boy who was Hispanic, about eight years old, why he wouldn't come into the park. And what he said was, the park was so nice, he didn't think it was for him. And it hurt because how could he think something that was for free was not for, he never saw anything like that in his neighborhood. It was so nice, you had to pay. And there it is. And you see a little boy running around, and that's him. His life and the children in that neighborhood's life will change because now they have something of value that they can call their own, where they can grow and make friends and connect with all their family members. So I continue to do this work because of little boys like that and these communities that had these asphalt fields that were unloved, and I know the impact it has on a community. Yes, even a neighborhood park can have that power. This program now, we've already completed 47 of the 67. We should be able to complete another 10 or 12 this year. Uh, we have now created these Friends Up groups, volunteers, that after these parks are changed and redeveloped, they actually care for them. And we're not seeing any vandalism whatsoever. When we respect the community with quality material, they respect us back in return. We give them inferior material and high fences and vandal proof, they in fact don't respect it. We've now been able through our programming to serve with this initiative 1.9 million children through our Kids in Motion program. They could have been in the street, now they're in the park enjoying themselves. And now usership has increased over 50% on these unloved public spaces. So we know the impact it's having on the community, and this is a program that keeps driving me about equity being fair and how it's having a real impact on communities where we're putting in these projects. So I'm now gonna shift gears to uh, planning and placemaking. Uh, as a parks planner, I wanna to explain to staff that I don't just want us to create a park or a space, but we have to make a place. It's something very different. And it's about experiences, it's about memories, it's about being authentic. And that's something I'm committed to do with my staff. We look very closely at generations. When we have public meetings, we don't just plan for who shows up. We take a deep dive on the demographics, on the generational differences, so that we're able to plan for the community and not just those who show up for the public meeting. We make sure we do our extra work. Why? Uh, because we know for every project we do, that each generation has values, needs, and aspirations for neighborhoods and for parks. We want to make sure we're building it for them, that we meet their desires for what they want for a public space in the future. And we're seeing things change. Pickleball, South American volleyball, cricket is now being, we just had a conversation the other day that we're going to start transforming all of our ball fields to crickets because now there's a higher demand for cricket. What about pickleball? Anybody know pickleball? Oh, oh okay. That sport's really starting to travel. Because previous generations were consumers of goods, but the newer generations are consumers of experiences. 
That's why they're moving to cities and demanding these quality public spaces that they can enjoy. So I told my staff, we're not just going to be designers and planners, but we're going to be experience builders. When I look at a park, it's not just designing green space, it's how do we build an experience in this public space. And I know how to do it, because I see the Buffalo Bayou, and I see Herman Park and other parks, Memorial Park. You know how to build those experiences in Levy Park, that that is what people are looking for. That's where they're looking for public spaces that they could go to those cities and enjoy. So I have a saying that people may eat and sleep in their homes or apartments, but they live in the public realm. That's where the action is. That's why millennials and Gen Y and now Gen Alpha, they love cities because they love the experience. And they'd rather pay less and have a small apartment, but have access to a city that has quality public spaces. In fact, in New York City, we get 130 million visits to our parks every year. That's how big they're in demand. And I can tell you, it's probably the same thing here. If we come here some peak season, uh, whether Dorian and others will tell me, these public spaces are just packed. People are demanding those public spaces. This is just an average day in Central Park for one of our festivals. You'll see this almost every single weekend. And so here's another experience. Why are these young people sitting on a bench watching cars go by on 10th Avenue, but that's the experience that they enjoy. This is on the High Line. It's a very popular spot, but you sit there watching cars go by. By the way, they have a video on this car opera. Has anybody seen it? So they had these people singing, and every time a different color car went by, they sang a different tune. It's the most bizarre thing you could actually get online. So it happened right here. And then look at this underperforming ad. This is in the middle of Broadway and Fifth Avenue near 23rd Street. We took underperforming asphalt, a street, put some chairs, tables, and flowers, and made asphalt a top destination right near Italy and Madison Square and the famous Flatiron Building. We created an experience. That's why they're there. You think they said, oh, we're in the middle of the street? We created, oh, I see someone else. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Okay, another friend. So that got me thinking about the public realm that it's time to rethink the entire public realm. Everything, bike lanes, sidewalks, public spaces. New York City has, parks represents 14% of the public realm. And streets and sidewalks represents another 26%. So 40% of New York City is the public realm. But we don't act like it. The average citizen does not know when they're walking on parks property or the Department of Transportation, and guess what? They don't care, but the agencies do. It's like different countries and different territories, and so our goal in New York City was how do we plan for this one unit that belongs to the public together and not let one agency over the other dominate. We wanted to have a unified public realm. That's the same picture, that's that triangle that was unused, and now is this incredible public space that we did not have to buy. Didn't have to acquire it, we owned it, we just reprogrammed it for a better public purpose. Someone once said that the sidewalk adjacent to the park should be considered the outer park, and that person was Frederick Law Umstead. So as we're looking at the public realm, I told my staff, when you see a sidewalk, I see an outer park. And in fact, uh, in our charter, it says that the parks department shall manage and care for all parks, squares, public places, and the sidewalks. And I was so happy to see that, because from now on, we're going to redesign the sidewalk as well as the park itself. This is Rufus King Park. You see a sidewalk. I see an outer park. This will now all be converted to a bioswale, and we're going to start punching holes through the fence, because in New York, we are fence and gate happy, if you didn't know that. Thank you, Houston, for not doing this to your parks. Just give yourselves a round of applause. I don't like fences and gates, and you'll see the reason why. Give yourself a round of applause. The first thing I, wait, you don't have any fences or gates around parks, right? Okay, good. So here's an example, right? I, I have a feeling we thought the trees were gonna run away at night, so we decided to <laughs> defense it in. I, I don't know why that fence is there. And even, you have to duck to go through that doorway, it makes absolutely no sense. And so I had this big battle. I wanted to start removing fences and taking them down. And people said, oh my goodness, it's going to make us less safe. Oh, really? A person's being assaulted halfway down the block. Can you see them? Oh, you can't. Because in fact, these fences were becoming obstacles 
blocking sight lines, and people don't have a real connection to nature. So I was on this mission to either remove or take down the fences, and I have to tell you, being in New York, it was very controversial because people remembered that New York from the 70s and 80s when it was very dangerous, and not today where less, less than 1% of all crime in New York City occurs in our parks. Very safe. And then look at this wonderful little area next to our pool where you could take your kids to have a, a lunch while they're learning how to swim, but it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. Why do we have to cage up our kids just to have lunch? Half the fence would have served the same purpose for not having a child run out into the pool. So I'll give you a little bit of a preview, but we've already in the process of changing it to provide more dignity and respect, because I do not want to cage children in just to have lunch. So these were things that was always part of New York that I just came with a different perspective to say we have to bring more dignity and equity to our park system. That gave birth to a program called Parks Without Borders. It has now been implemented both in New York and nationally. Basically, the mayor gave me $50 million to do this pilot program, which is now part of the Parks Department's portfolio. It's very simple. The goal was to look at the edges, the entrances, and adjacent park spaces and change them so that it's more welcoming to the public. We don't need to have all these tall fences. The last slide, all those bricks that you see there is parkland, yet it's being underused. We're now gonna take down that fence, pull the entire park back, and reclaim it. Again, we own it, don't have to buy it. We just have to do a better job on managing what we have. So, in terms of the entrances, we wanna take those fences down so people have a better connection into the park. It's safer, because now you can see in. You don't have all those obstacles. Number two, uh, we now put more benches on the sidewalk. Uh, parks close, but sidewalks never close. And so now people can still sit down, enjoy themselves, read a paper, whatever time it is, and lowering a fence improves the sight line so people can see in. It. It's a, such a major difference when you actually now can see the green versus looking through a bunch of bars. And now we're eliminating all of these weird dioramas that we just close off these spaces and now we're opening up on corners where the public can enjoy them. So this has been just a major transformation. So because it was a pilot, we wanted to make sure we didn't force it on anyone, so we asked the public to nominate their park. We had both online, and for those that were not as internet savvy, we had public meetings and people chose us, open this entrance, take down this wall, take down this fence. We thought we would get 1,000 nominations. <clears throat> we got 6,000. The problem is we could only afford to do eight. So it was a tough uh, <laughs> decision to do. And so you see the dots by the votes of all the parks. Prospect Park was the biggest vote getter of well over, I think over 800 votes uh, to be part of that program. So we touched almost every borough. It was a very popular program. We didn't force on the public. You had to nominate your park. So we chose eight. I'm gonna quickly show you two. All of these are now under construction except Fort Greene. We're in litigation on Fort Greene. I can't talk about it because we're in litigation, uh, but <clears throat> we'll start with Seward first. Seward's in the Lower East Side, uh, and it is the first municipal playground in the United States. It has this beautiful setting, this wonderful garden, high fence, and this library that's in the background, which is adjacent to the park, not necessarily connected to the park. And so this is one that we felt it uh, was one candidate. This is your entrance to the library. It's so exciting, it's just locked. It like, made absolutely no sense. You literally had to walk around the block at least about another five minutes just to go into the library when it's literally right through those gates. Uh, the first thing we want to do uh, is lower the fence four feet and so you could actually enjoy this beautiful garden. Uh, yeah, I don't know if this has... Oh, I can't really see. So uh, the lower part is where the late locked gates were. You had to walk all the way around into the park to get to the library. Uh, now you're on the steps of the library. That lock gates I talked to you about is to my left, and you had to walk around the park to go through that path. And so it's going to go basically from this to this. We owned it. It was very simple. We opened it up, and now this one we opened up about uh, two months ago. And there it is. And for the first time, he's actually looking into the park because before he wouldn't do that. You'd look straight ahead because literally that fence acted as if it was a, a wall. 
Prospect Park was the other one. This is where I grew up and ran around this park with my brother. Never understood why there was a fence and a berm there. Always wanted to cut a hole so that you have an entrance off of Flatbush Avenue. Somebody said, why would you ever want to do that? A fence is there for a reason. Nobody wants to go in that direction. I go, really? <laughs> yes, they do. And so after careful planning, this became the other candidate, and for the first time in, I believe, 50 years, there'll be a new entrance added to Prospect Park on the less affluent side of the park. Not just one, but two. Prior to that, if you're in Park Slope or other parts around the park, you had multiple entrances, but on the Flappish Avenue side, you had none. Three quarters of a mile you'd have to walk to go to the first entrance. Now that's being solved with two, and there's now gonna be a crosswalk where cars will now have to stop so people can now get in. This is what, because it's the Umstead Park, we had to go through landmarks. This is a new design. Uh, we want to make sure it fit into with the landscape. That's one view. That's the other view. This one is right now under construction and should be finished sometime this year. So you come to New York. I encourage you to go to this new entrance and see how marvelous it's going to look. Now I'm going to quickly go through resiliency, and I have one other topic to cover. Uh, in terms of resiliency, uh, like you, we were hit with a reality check. New York is a coastal city. We have 525 miles of coastline, and of those 525 miles, 155 miles is in parkland. So we now knew we had to change the way we think about taking care of our parks. We have 14 miles of public beaches, and Superstorm Stanley, we lost 42 lives. Uh, cost over close to a billion dollars of damage to close to 400 parks. And we knew the most vulnerable population lived within a half mile of the flood zone, so we had to do things very, very differently. First, we wanted to make sure we had resilient waterfront parks. Uh, I'll, you can read it yourselves, but we had to find a way of changing our uh, ecosystem because we now knew that our parks, particularly in New York, where Coastal City would be our first line of defense. We came up with two guys. The first one was high performance landscape and then designing and planning for flood and resiliency guidelines, which is now influencing how we build throughout New York City. I'll just give you some quick examples. We have now natural system based, hard structure based, and integrated flood protection systems. Since now any project near the waterfront must undergo this analysis so that now we water protect lives because we don't want to see any more lives or property lost like we did for Superstorm Sandy. And ours was a, not a hurricane, it was a superstorm that did that damage. So this is Long Island City. This is one of the parks I told Bill when he goes to New York he has to see. This is designed to be a floodable park in Long Island City. Manhattan's on the other side. And so it's a beautiful space. When this park gets flooded, where you see that bridge, that creates an island. But you can get off, there's a bridge, but it's really cool. But it's a floodable park. Here's another view, a closer at high tide. It actually creates an island. So there are some parks that are floodable. There are other parts of recreation. We have to do something very differently to protect those parks and the public. Uh, this is the one we're about to <sighs> rebuild and put 10 feet of veil on top of this park. So every tree will be removed. But this is the lower side that got impacted the most after the Rockaways from Superstorm Sandy. And now what we're going to do, this is now the after, that we're going to elevate the entire park uh, 10 feet. The flood protection will be at the water's edge. And now we'll be able to build the trees back to be more salt tolerant and will not have the flooding. Uh, and this is the water's edge. Uh, now, rather than being at sea level, it'll now have a get down. It's 10 feet higher. But this one has recreation, so it can't be a floodable park. So we have to invest. This one's going to be $1.5 billion to build this park. Uh, but uh, we got some money from HUD, but we wanted to protect properties and lives. And so this project uh, goes under construction this year. So I want to end on a happy note. A lot of people say, oh, your equity work costs so much money. It's very expensive, $300 million. This Cool Pools initiative was done for $150,000 per pool. We used staff. We got donations from paint companies and furniture companies and came up with this very cool program. So this is Cool Pools. It's one to keep cool, but also to keep cool. So we wanted everyone to have a good time. Our focus was on municipal pools that look pretty bad. We focus on these 1970-era pools that were all built on these modular units. And uh, that's what it looked like. These horrible places 
that our public had to go to for the summer, and we said we can do much better. We have graphic designers that came up with the graphics, we had our in-house painters, and we were able to transform about uh, 11 pools into what you're about to see. So this is what it looked like. Those are those modular units. You know, that's, I guess, a mural of some sort. And uh, people now are calling it the resort. And this is why. That is what it looks like today. 150,000 per pool because we wanted to find a way of improving our equity by giving our public quality spaces. Here's one example. There's another one. Uh, you see the way it's being engaged. I can, it, the tables, our, our horticultural team put plants out there, these nice umbrellas, Adirondack chairs, even the ones for little kids. I love those little Adirondack chairs, so cute. <laughs> we have penguins and polar bear because they're cool, so we're cool. Um, we have the police involved with cornhole. It's not just, if you don't want to swim, you can still go there and have fun. You can eat. You're not caged up anymore. Nice open spaces where the family can enjoy. And of course, my staff is so cool. You see on the edge there, Marco Polo. They're so talented. Oh my goodness. 150000 per pool. If there's a will and a desire, you can find a way. This one has been transformative. Uh, visitation has increased over 50%. These are now known in the neighborhood as the resort. And now we're finding people are deserving these quality places. So for us, as I said, it's not just creating a pool or a park. It's creating a place, an experience where people can enjoy, where they can connect and have fun, and is changing New York City from neighborhood to neighborhood by just thinking differently about saying equity is important, fairness is important, and you can get it done. So as I close, our goal is to build an inclusive park system with a seamless public realm that is equitable and resilient for present and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. That was very inspiring. Uh, we're going to take questions now. If you have a question and you write it down on your uh, notepad, hold it up, note card, hold it up, and they'll bring it down. Let me begin by asking, how do you balance? So, so kind of like Houston, Mitchell, New York has lots and lots of parks, many of which have been ignored, and also these incredible world-renowned gems of parks, right, which are well served by private conservancies, right? How do you strike a balance, and what is the role of the private conservancy versus the public parks department in sorting all that out? Well, in New York City, we have uh, a number of conservancies, and they do take care of some of our marquee parks. It's a license agreement, so we tend to maintain a lot of control about what the conservancies can or cannot do. Number one, for our equity initiative, all the conservancies, through in-kind and cash contributions, uh, gave us $15 million, five year over three years, to help with this equity initiative. So that was one. Number two, we also have somewhat of a citywide conservancy called the City Parks Foundation, but we do welcome private support. Now, what's different about New York and Texas is that we don't have these caps on revenue, so we can invest the public money into our parks. So we have a bit of an advantage. Uh, we don't want to rely solely on the private sector to improve all of our public parks. That's something through our tax dollars we expect the city government to do, and we're doing. So it's difficult to compare um, Houston to New York, but what you don't want to have is a two-tier park system. One that is cared by the conservancies and others just by the city without the resources to keep them up to par like those conservancy parks. So that's something I think over time Houston's going to have to work through, but you have to find out other dedicated revenue streams that you need to take care of some of those other parks because it's something you have to do because you can see the impact it has on people living in those neighborhoods throughout the city. So I do support public-private partnerships, but I also know that you can't create, increase that disparity by not figuring out on the public side how to invest in all those other public spaces. Um, you took over, uh, as you did in Raleigh in the planning department, you took over a, a city agency with a long history of doing things a certain way. 
and you tried to move that agency to doing things a different way. And you know, sometimes with government agencies, that can be hard. How did you do that? What were the techniques you used uh, to get that agency to adopt the changes you described? Well, uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't easy. Um, and part of it is just force of personality, and you have to show people what are some of the problems so you get them to kind of look very differently. One, I have this general belief that when it comes to government, that fragmented government produces fragmented results. Fragmented government produces fragmented results, so we had to figure out how we had to work together. Uh, number two, I also believe uh, that we have to hire the best and brightest. In most cities, public sector employees look very different than the private sector. I was a partner of a firm, a planning firm, yet when I joined the uh, planning department, for some reason they thought my IQ dropped by like 50. No, I'm the same person. I just went from private job to public job. <coughs> So I had to communicate to staff that we're not just going to be public employees, we're going to be public sector consultants. And we're going to change the way we work, and we'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other private sector entity to show them how good we really are. We just had to change our disposition. We had to give them a vision. We had to create Raleigh as a very special place and create a buzz. And so over the years, as we're able to change the way we do business, streamline regulations, uh, start to incentivize the things we want to see downtown, uh, we made it so hard to do downtown development that all the developers just went out to the green fields. And so we were just smarter, we had a vision, we had a mission, and we just changed our habit. But the thing is that you had to trust the public sector, and we had to do that by saying we're now public sector consultants. That was Raleigh. New York is a whole different story. But that's just a Raleigh story. <laughs> and it worked. I mean, it went from being, where is Raleigh, where now it's being talked about as the number one place for this, the number two place for that. I think the, the, it was a partnership between the business community, between government, uh, and the citizens to really say we want to create a great city, and we're all on board. And it was no disrespect of all the public sector employees. We all realized that if you're successful, public sector, we're successful because we get a great city in return. And that's something we had to really push to get that mutual respect from the citizens and from the business community to help create a great city. Um, when you go into um, uh, neighborhoods in New York and you're talking about improving parks that have been long neglected in neighborhoods that are neighborhoods where people have modest incomes, um, inevitably the gentrification question comes up. How do you deal with that in that situation? It does come up, uh, and I think gentrification does happen in some rare cases, but it doesn't happen all the time. The challenge I face is I go to community, and if I do nothing, they say, you're neglecting us. And if I do something, you're gentrifying us. It's like, you have me in a known win situation wherever I do, so I'm going to pick what I think is best. I'm going to improve that public space, because I will not let a child or a family go another 10 or 20 years with an inferior space because someone's afraid it may lead to gentrification. We have not found in a neighborhood setting a neighborhood park of an acre or two being redeveloped uh, creating any issues of gentrification. I haven't found it. Now for a waterfront park, for a downtown park, uh, for master plan parks, I may see it, but on a regular neighborhood park I don't see it, so I'm not willing to deny another generation of families a quality space because one or two people are afraid it may lead to gentrification. It's a tough conversation, but that's my approach. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Robert Moses a little while ago. Yeah. You sit in his chair. Um, if you've been paying attention to Houston, you know that as our, as our questioner says, we in Houston are staring down the battle of another highway, barrel of another highway expansion effort, I-45. You don't need another highway, there's like highways all over the city. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. All right, so that pretty much answers Highways don't leave that, pretty much answers that question. Also, I love this saying, I, mean, it, I don't know if you've ever heard this before. It's like saying, I'm not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. You ever heard that before? No. Not a good joke for Houston. All right. Um, <coughs> do you... Um, I was here in the 90s when I was driving my wife around. It's like, there's like more highways and there's still traffic. That was like the 1990s. So obviously, it's not working. Um, uh, what, measure, what strategies do you use to measure or quantify the social and environmental benefits of the improvements you're putting in? Is it all qualitative or, or how do you do that? 
We were very fortunate that uh, there were two measures. One, we have something called park score, so we check the usership before and after, and that's where we're able to capture some of our numbers. And then one of our local schools of public health uh, got a grant to do a longitudinal study to see how it's affecting both health and behavior of the community. And so right now we have some preliminary results, but we're actually seeing great results about usership, about health behaviors, and so at least from that study, we're able to see the improvements. From the crime side, we're seeing less crime in our parks. Uh, and so the problem is not all of NY our police department measured the crime at that time, because now they expanded um, how they're looking at crime statistics, but refining all of our improved parks are not seeing any major crimes at all. So we do have some evidence that improving these public spaces are actually having uh, uh, health benefits, uh, crime benefits, uh, as well as um, usership, and more people in the park makes the park safer. Okay, um, that's great. Uh, another question that, that uh, here's a, a, a variation on a number of questions. A number of people have asked um, how you are using or incorporating either recycled materials or native plants. Both. So we now require all native species. We have a whole horticultural division that goes through some of our lands to remove invasives. Uh, so that's one thing that we do. In terms of recycled material, uh, where we can repurpose it, we do repurpose it. A lot of the fence that you see that we cut down is recycled and used in other spaces. So we do have a heavy recycling program, and we also have a very ambitious program about removing invasives but planting natural species in our parks. You can't put a planner up in front of an audience in Houston without somebody asking a question about zoning. Sure. And so I think the, the, you know, the question is, I think the question is, you know, what is the relationship between parks and zoning? What is the relationship between planning and zoning? And, and you know, what lessons can we draw from that here in Houston, where, as you know, there's right. no zoning, at least no zoning for use? Uh, well, first, I don't think there's any direct relationship between zoning and planning unless it's what you're building around that park, which will impact the usership within the park. So I don't think there's any direct connection. Um, I don't know the full history of uh, zoning and planning in Houston, but zoning and planning are two different things, and I think a lot of people very often confuse the two. Zoning is law. Planning is ideas. It's advisory. And to me, uh, I get very worried when a place does not have planning because I remember when I was in Raleigh, what really the development community appreciated and people looking to move, I would show them where Raleigh's headed for the next 20 years and like saying, I want to invest here. You know exactly what's going to go where, exactly what's going to be developed. This, this is amazing. I'm not used to this. And they really felt that their money was a good investment because they knew if you bought a home, I knew it would be nearby. If I lived here, I knew where the park would be developed. I just knew because there are two types of cities, in my opinion. There are plan-making cities, and there are deal-making cities. And Guess Raleigh which one Houston is. I assume deal-making? All right. And working in a plan-making city really worked well with the development community and those looking to do business for our city because it gave them the certainty and predictability and flexibility that they were looking for rather than a deal-making city. What can go here? I don't know. Let's make a deal. And so for us, it was very easy for me to figure out where the schools would go, where the roads would go, how big the pipes should be, because we had a well-planned city. Now, that's just my point of view. But even in Raleigh, people got confused between what's zone planning, I'm sorry, which is law, and planning, which is policy, it's advisory, it's about ideas. And so that, to me, is something that uh, I'm not sure how that plays out uh, in Houston. But yes, you do have a reputation of not having zoning, but you do have a number of ordinances to control what's built. OK, uh, we've got time for about two more questions. So one, is, one question is, you, you've met, you're, fairly, you, you're fairly familiar with Fifth Ward in Kashmir. You've been there several times. You're, your wife is from there. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of contaminated land in that area, right? Railroads and industrial right. sites and stuff. Um, uh, given, the, given the cost of cleanup and so forth, um, what is the best way for a community like that to go about reclaiming some of those spaces, using them for parks, public spaces, whatever? That is a tough question because there, you can <laughs> put fill or cap a, it's a complicated question, but if there's a desire to reclaim a public space, it has to be in partnership with the city, the private sector. I don't think any one community 
has the funds to cap it, to remove the fill, to replace the fill, but it's something that really has to be a collective desire of both the public, private sector uh, to put that project together. Because it is very, very expensive, as you know, to remediate uh, contaminated soil. The upside is, as you saw some, from our, some of our parks in Brooklyn Bridge, that had to be cleaned up, Riverside, that had to be cleaned up. So there is a huge return on investment once you clean it up, but that's something where it has to be a partnership between the public, the private, but a community cannot do this alone. It's just way, way too expensive. Uh, final question before, and then, and then Mitchell will be here um, uh, uh, after, after we conclude. Um, how do neighborhood parks redevelopment, such as you've described, support community organizing? Another way to say this is, do you have and support community-based parks conservancies? You have the friends. Of we the have park. we have friends groups, and that serves the same thing. They can actually raise money. We have a citywide conservancy that will hold their account. But these places are amazing. We have sixty thousand volunteers, in over six hundred friends groups. I go out myself to go out there and plant bulbs and rake leaves because if they're spending their Saturday loving one of our parks, I'm going to be there by their side. So we support them. They're great stewards. They're the first ones who call us if something's wrong. They're the eyes and ears. And they have these incredible programming, you know, outdoor movies, puppet shows, dinners where the table goes from here to there, where they have kind of Thanksgiving in the summer. It is amazing how these become these wonderful spaces. And so we support them. We give them rakes. We give them whatever they need to help uh, th those parks thrive. So sort of small scale. They're very small scale. It could be a group of maybe uh, 10 women. We have a group called ARF ARF, where through uh, having um, dog parks, they're transforming parks and making them safer. Yeah, ARF ARF. I thought it was cool, too. It was amazing. <laughs> I wish I would have thought that myself. Uh, and so, uh, but we want to create that environment where we support them, uh, we recognize them, we give them awards each year for volunteerism, and so for us it's something that works incredibly well. So, uh, okay, I, I realize there's one more question that all planners must be asked when they come to Houston, right, which is, so what do you think we should do with the Astrodome? <laughs> I don't know! <laughs> I don't know, but uh, I'm sure next time I come back, I'll have an answer. Well, all right, there you go. Well, thank you very much, Mitchell Silver. Thank Thanks for coming from New York.